is a very auspicious time to be having this discussion, and in part it's because the OECD has begun what appears to be a sincere and, and concerted effort to address the very problems that we're discussing here today, uh, to name those problems, and to, uh, to address them as best uh, they can, given the political realities in which the OECD needs to work. And I am about to say many things that are very critical of the OECD guidelines, and I've said many of them in print, and I want to emphasize that these problems, which I think are very, very real, and are not at the point yet of being solved, uh, are problems that go back many years, well before the tenure of the people now at the OECD and elsewhere who are trying uh, to, uh, to fix things. And there are a lot of people around the world in all, all different roles who are doing their best to try to make what I personally believe to be a very flawed system uh, serve the world better. And, and by serving the world better, I mean allowing uh, governments to collect the revenues which the legislatures of those governments appear to have said are properly uh, collectible. And I think this issue has become extremely poignant in the last few years as uh, the uh, developing countries have uh, got become, become much more involved in the so-called globalized economy. And these are often countries with extremely pressing social needs, the redress of which will require access to uh, national revenues, and frankly, one of the obstacles to uh, collecting those revenues are flaws in tax administration and in some of the conceptualization of the tax system. The most commonly quoted uh, uh, statement of the Arbitrage Principle is in both Article 9 of the OECD Model Tax Treaty and Paragraph 1.6 of the OECD Guidelines. And it says, where conditions are made or imposed between two enterprises in their commercial or financial relations which differ from those which would be made between independent enterprises, then any profits which would, but for those conditions, have accrued to one of the enterprises but by reason of those conditions have not so accrued, may be included in the profits of that enterprise and taxed accordingly. It's very clear that this language envisions the arm's length principle as a tool to be used in tax administration and particularly tax enforcement. The arm's length principle is put there to enable tax administrations to identify situations in which income is being apportioned improperly and to require the taxpayer involved to report income as if it had been apportioned properly. It's an enforcement principle. Now, the enforcement principle, the, is based, the arm's length principle, is based on an economic uh, idea. It's a, it's a principle of economic neutrality, and it's articulated in paragraph 1.8 of the OECD guidelines. And it says, there are several reasons why OECD member countries and other countries have adopted the arm's length principle. A major reason is that the arm's length principle provides broad, word broad is important here, broad parity of tax treatment for members of MNE groups, multinational enterprise groups, and independent enterprises. Because the arm's length principle puts associated and independent enterprises on a more equal footing for tax purposes, it avoids the creation of tax advantages or disadvantages, double taxation, double non-taxation, that would otherwise distort the relative competitive positions of either type of entity. In so removing these tax considerations from economic decisions, the arm's length principle promotes the growth of international trade and investment. Now, and here's, here's a step that we don't often take. I think the statement of the arm's length principle in paragraph 1.6, uh, coupled with the rationale of economic neutrality that the OECD has provided in paragraph 1.8, allow us to state the arm's length principle very concisely, and in a way I think uh, shines a light on what we're all about here. I think you can state the arm's length principle this way. 
members of groups of, commonly, of groups of commonly controlled companies should not, because of the fact of common control, be permitted to enjoy more favorable, more favorable tax treatment of the income derived from their business activities than independent companies engaged in similar activities. So the arm's length standard is a principle of tax enforcement that is designed to prevent companies from deriving tax advantages because they operate in group form rather than conducting business as independent enterprises transacting with one another as arm's length businesses. It's so important for us to keep some elements of what I just said in mind because first, the OECD guidelines don't purport, and of course they can purport, to be looking at perfection in measuring national tax bases. The OECD guidelines recognize the goal has got to be broad parity. And in a real world, if you can even get broad parity, you're doing pretty well. Trying to get beyond that is, is, a, is a recipe for self-destructiveness. Uh, now, now that we've gotten this, this little, the, the conceptual matter of what is the arms length principle, what is this enforcement principle out of the way, um, let me talk a bit about uh, some particular portions of the guidelines and particularly those portions that the uh, OECD is now trying to address by, uh, in the draft guidance it, it, it issued last week. And uh, I'd like to put these, these portions of the guideline in a political and historical perspective so that we can get a better idea of how we might move forward um, productively. Um, and I think there really were two main uh, political conditions that existed in the late 1980s and early 1990s that uh, gave rise to the guidelines that we're dealing with today. Uh, the first uh, basic set of conditions deals with uh, income shifting. Uh, for more than 60 years, well before the drafting of the OECD guidelines, this really goes back to the immediate post-war era, multinational companies based primarily in what are now OECD countries have avoided very large amounts of taxes by means of contracts made among members of commonly controlled groups which assign income from real business operations conducted in high tax countries to intangible holding companies and also to hub companies under the so-called restructurings that have occurred over the last 15 years that uh, purport, to, uh, purport to concentrate the risks of the global business upon themselves located in zero and low tax countries. The guidelines, while devoting a large number of words to the analysis of situations, essentially bless these arrangements. Uh, a couple of years ago, the OECD had a project um, to address so-called business restructurings, which uh, amounted to an expansion of the strategies that previously had been uh, accomplished through only through intangibles licensing. And it was a, I was president in much of the, the, the discussion, um, and it was a very politicized process, and um, it generated a very long document which is now a paragraph nine of the OECD guidelines, which essentially decided to not to take a stand uh, strongly against the use of in, in, uh, risk shifting contracts and other kinds of income shifting contracts uh, as vehicles for tax planning. Now, income shifting as we know it today represents the clearest possible violation of the arms length principle at least if that principle is seen as requiring neutrality between the tax treatment of members of common control groups and groups of independent businesses conducting the same business activities. It is simply impossible for an independent business entity to, to conduct actual business activities in one country, but arrange for the income to be taxed in another lower tax country. That can only happen when groups of companies act in concert. A single company can't do that. That should be the paradigmatic situation in which everyone concerned with the arm's length principle pounces on the situation and says, you can't do that. But the problem is that when the guidelines were written, and I'm, I shouldn't pick entirely on the OECD guidelines. The OECD guidelines are largely based on the US transfer pricing regulations which preceded the guidelines. So it's not as if we can point to the OECD as an institution as the source of all this uh, difficulty. Um, by the time these guidelines were established, the use of income shifting structures 
had already been common for about 40 years. Uh, so the harsh fact of the matter is that in the late 1980s, early 1990s, the, no, body, no political body in the world, whether the US Congress or the OECD, could generate a body of transfer pricing legislation or rules that would disallow these income shifting structures. It was simply politically impossible. And so the US government and the OECD, following the US government, had to make a choice. They could either say, well, the, the arm's length principle is just violated, the, the horse has left the barn, we've just got to accept that fact. Or we could put together a, group, a set of rules that don't uh, realize the arm's length principle and say that they do. And that's what happened. We have a set of guidelines that uses the words arm's length repeatedly, over and over and over again, built around the concept of protecting companies that are violating the arm's length standard in the most, in the grossest possible way. And that is basically the problem of intangibles and of restructuring that anyone involved in transfer pricing policy making is facing today. I think the, the evidence is abundantly clear that these um, techniques have uh, depleted the U.S. corporate income tax base to an amazing extent. They've largely repealed the U.S. corporate income tax. Other countries that take this element of the guidelines into their own law are risking the same thing, and they shouldn't do it. Now, that doesn't mean that countries should not adopt the OECD, the, the, the arms length principle, and for that matter, shouldn't adopt large portions of the guidelines. I think there's a lot in the guidelines that's actually useful in tax administration. But one thing countries need to do is one way or the other make clear that in adopting OECD guidelines or similar bodies of law, th those rules will not operate to, to allow companies to shift income through the, through the medium of intergroup contracts. And uh, this is, you would think this is mainly a concern of the more developed countries because you tend to think of the income shifting going from the headquarters companies of multinationals out to tax havens. That's not the case, however. Um, this is a great concern even to the, the poorest of developing countries because companies can use restructuring techniques to strip risk from <coughs> the supposedly routine operations conducted in your country. You are vulnerable to these techniques even if you don't have home-based multinationals. If you have home-based multinationals, it's even, the problem is even, you're, you're even more vulnerable. And so we've seen as the BRIC countries develop more home-based multinationals, more and more of, a, of an expression of political concern with the effects of some elements of the OECD guidelines. And some of the conflict that we've seen discussed here today relates to that fact that suddenly companies, uh, countries are finding that they want to be part of the OECD, they want to be part of this general club of, of nations with similar economic interests, but they don't, don't want to adopt rules that are going to allow their homegrown multinationals to pull income out of their tax bases, and it's caused a great deal of conflict. The only solution that I can see in the short term is to do something along the lines of what I suggest in the most recent of the articles that um, we've inflicted upon you in your um, meeting materials, with recent article in mind anyway, which is to have national legislation that clearly states that these con that contracts among members of groups, while they'll be respected for business purposes, that businesses can order their affairs however they like, that they will not be respected for tax purposes. Another way of putting that in, um, arms, in a transfer pricing terminology is that we will that countries will insist that the risks of business activities uh, be treated as following the functions with which those risks are associated. That way, you can't you can't separate the income from an activity from the actual conducting of that activity. Now, I know that there are lots of conceptual questions involved in what I just said, and that's a reflection of the fact that transfer pricing can never be made totally simple. But I can't state strongly enough, both less, less developed countries, BRIC countries, developing countries, if you, want to, uh, take, if you want to use the OECD guidelines, you've got to protect yourself from, in, 
from income stripping, both through intangibles contracts and from stripping away income from operations, even in the um, most um, the, the, the poorest countries. Okay. Um, now, so one of the um, one of the problems that the OECD guidelines present, and it goes back many years, as I just said, is uh, income shifting, income stripping, and countries simply can't sign on to that if they want to protect their tax bases. There's another set of historical circumstances that uh, existed in the late 80s and 90s that um, has also caused some other problems that the OECD is now trying to deal with. Um, back in the, those of you who remember the late 80s and early 90s, as I guess most of us here looking around probably do, uh, those of you who don't, good for you. Uh, but uh, remember, uh, in the late 80s, for various reasons, there was a, an outcry in the United States that income was being shifted out from the United States to uh, foreign automobile manufacturers. Remember, there was this, there's this thought that uh, Japanese-owned uh, automobile companies were stripping income from their U.S. subsidiaries, and German automobile companies were stripping income from their U.S. subsidiaries. There was actually a fair amount of xenophobia surrounding this kind of uh, concern. Um, and uh, also, there, uh, there was a widespread concern in Congress uh, about income stripping through, um, through intangible uh, licenses. And so it was the US in the, the Treasury White Paper of 1988 uh, that suggested greatly simplifying transfer pricing rules uh, applying what a, a very uh, powerful version of what now is called the TNMM in OECD parlance or CPM in, in US parlance, and greatly simplifying the rules from the standpoint of tax administrations. And the intent was to make it a lot easier for the US IRS to collect money and transfer pricing adjustments from multinational corporations. Uh, that, for a while, was pretty popular politically in the United States. The rest of the world, though, hated it. Um, those other uh, countries didn't perceive a particular uh, problem with the way the automobile companies were behaving. <coughs> and in fact, they were probably right. Um, the, the reason why US uh, marketing subsidiaries of automobile companies weren't making money in the late 80s and early 90s had a lot more to do with the uh, depreciation of the dollar than it did anything having to do with, um, with tax planning. Uh, and secondly, the, those other countries were, did not yet consider themselves vulnerable to the kind of income stripping that has only hit their, their boundaries in the last 10 or 15 years because of restructurings. Other countries have had CFC rules that had largely protected them against income stripping through uh, intangibles migrations. So the other members of the OECD, notably Germany, uh, the UK, and Japan, um, hated the idea of simplified transfer pricing methods. And they joined with business interests who also hated the idea of easily enforceable transfer pricing methods to make the OECD guidelines and the US transfer pricing regs as opaque, convoluted, self-contradictory, and fact-intensive as possible. I can't, if, if you ever want to have a good laugh, go through either the US regulations or the OECD guidelines and see how many times you're, you're reminded that you can only conduct tax administration based on analysis of all the facts and circumstances. Now, that has never, I, I've been doing this stuff for decades. I've done it, I, I, I started, well, not, sorry, I was the second director of the US APA program. I've done innumerable matters as a private practitioner. I have never once in my life seen an analysis done by anyone that addresses all the relevant facts and circumstances. It just doesn't happen. You have these stylized, big, thick documents, much of which consists of appendices that are just copied from regulations and guidelines and whatever, that tell you absolutely nothing. No one can do this stuff. The IRS can't do this stuff. Uh, no one can do it. And the, um, if, if anybody wants proof of that, and this would be easy to, to be seen, just get the legislature of your country if you're an OECD country, to pull a large sampling of transfer pricing documentation from your country's examination files and see what the kind of factual analysis that is supposed to be done 
really looks like. You'll find that it is utterly worthless and that there is a huge, huge tendency of people to try to pretend that these factual analyses are occurring when in fact they're not occurring at all. And another uh, way to see proof of this is to slog through any of the relatively recent uh, US tax court cases in transfer pricing and try to follow the factual analysis that's described there. You'll find that you can't do it, that there's a long, long description of facts, and then the judge jumps to a 50-50 or some other kind of settlement based on a round number. Uh, so, and, and this is all on the public record. Now, to some extent, the documentation in this area and the court cases have, have, a, have adopted the same uh, defensive strategy as an elephant in the wild. I mean, it's just, it's really hard to bring down an elephant. <laughs> and it's really hard to read through all this stuff. I'd like to test how many people involved in this field ever have actually read all the way through either the US regulations or the OECD guidelines. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's fair to ask people if they have. And I think there's a real possibility for um, cooperation in simplifying uh, the administration of the of transfer pricing law, which would be a great benefit to developing and developed countries. Thank you.